Good evening, and welcome to the Cleveland Heights University Heights work session for Tuesday, the 16th of August. Welcome back, Mr. Gaynor. Will you call the roll, please? You, Mr. Wright. Here. Mr. Posh. Here. Mr. Heights. Ms. Serini. Here. Ms. Lewis. Here. And now I need a motion to approve the consent agenda, please. I motion to approve the consent agenda. I second. Any comments or questions about the consent agenda? I just have one comment. I would like to thank Delta Gray for her service to our district. She was a longtime administrative assistant at Garrity, and I think she was the face of Garrity for close to 30 years and quite a fixture in the city of University Heights. So I just wanted to thank her for her service and wish her very well on her retirement. Wonderful. And since I attended the new staff welcome breakfast this morning, I want to welcome all the new staff. And there's quite the list here. Um, I'm very happy to welcome new teachers, new cleaners, new paraprofessionals, everybody who's coming to join Tiger Nation. Mr. Gaynor, will you call the roll, please? Ms. Wright. Yes. Mr. Posh. Yes. Ms. Serini. Yes. Ms. Lewis. Yes. Okay, and moving on. It's one person. Number six. One person. Okay, so you know, I'm doing this on paper, and, and therefore I can't find anything anymore. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> so we're ready now for the strategic plan update. No? Personnel number six. Why am I not seeing it? have it on the, here's it not on the print. It's probably put on after you printed it on, okay. after you printed it. And the answer is no, I don't have it. Four. Oh, here we go. So this is consideration of approval of a letter of understanding and addendum to the negotiated agreement between the Board of Education and the Cleveland Heights Teachers Union. Okay, well, my bad, because I haven't seen it and I haven't read it, and therefore I am to be thwapped with a wet noodle. Do I have a motion to consider this, please, while I quickly find it and read it? I motion we consider it, and maybe Liz could just explain it to us. Second. Yeah. I second it. Thank you. All right, good evening. Um, these are an extension of some of our supplementals. I know we talked about academic challenge at the middle school, so this will allow academic challenge to be at both middle schools. Um, because of the amount of uh, additional work for our faculty managers at the middle school, it's an extra stipend for the faculty manager. And then we've added middle school swim um, that the uh, Joe is, uh, Joe D'Amato is looking to uh, expand the opportunities at the middle school. So it's for those three supplemental positions. Is that for swim coaches at the middle school? Are we going to have swim teams or is that swim for teams. swim like gym? No, that's, uh, that's competitive swimming okay. at the middle schools. All right. So seventh and eighth graders who are allowed to compete with other school districts or does it also include sixth graders? I believe it's seven and eight, not sixth grade. Okay. But I believe it's seven and eight. Middle school swim. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I'm personally pretty excited about that. Well, I know that people have been wanting the academic challenge team for quite a long time at the middle school, and that's a great program. It's a great feeder program into our high school, so I think that's exciting news. And anything involving swimming is good because we know that Water safety is hugely important. So, Mr. Gaynor, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Posh? Yes. Ms. Serini? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. Ms. Wright? Yes. Okay. And now we get to the strategic plan update. Yes. Ms. Kirby? So, I will ask, um, Kate, ben, can you project this? I'm not able to get into the meeting. Um, and as we load the presentation, 
sorry about that. Um, as we load the presentation, uh, just a reminder to the board, to audience members, that uh, we are in this season of reporting out on the progress of our strategic plan. Uh, we're going to report out on goals uh, three, four, and five today. Um, and then um, in subsequent, um, we did some reporting also on our academic goals, goals one and two, if, if you recall, in June. So we went through a data presentation then. Um, then we're going to focus on our family and community engagement goals, our goals around um, our professionals and culture of excellence, and our goals around our operational resources, technology, and finances. So we will have um, three different teams of presenters coming to talk about uh, the work that they um, have been leading this past year. And so you'll see those presenters listed there. Um, and I'll just kind of frame, before we start with the teams, I'll just frame the conversation. So reminding everyone, um, our mission as a district is to uh, provide a, an education that is challenging and engaging. We are seeking to support our students in becoming responsible citizens, and that citizens component is really important. Um, that are able to succeed in college and or career. They have that choice. Um, and then our vision, we want to embrace diversity, ensure that we have equitable experiences, um, and really focus on outstanding teaching and learning so that our students um, become academically prepared, critical thinkers, again, connected to this concept of responsible citizens and being prepared for success. And then finally, our core values that guide the work excellence, equity, integrity, trust, and uh, respect. And so this is across all of our goal areas, all of our departments, all of our schools, all of our staff. So I won't talk through these components, um, but what I will share in terms of the structure of this presentation, uh, we have talked quite a bit about our strategic plan. Um, and this is a session where we're really going to report out on the, uh, the work from the departments aligned to the strategic plan. I would say in the next slide, if you go to the slide with the big goals, we know our key data targets are all around uh, academic metrics. So third graders reading at or above grade level, 80% of students showing proficiency on state assessments, uh, course success in algebra for our ninth graders, four-year graduation rate, and um, students pursuing college or viable career pathways. So those are our big academic targets. But what I want to say today is that our presenters, the work that they are doing, all are in support of these data targets. And so we will not speak to these areas today, but please know all the work that these teams are doing are designed to help us get here. So the other thing I'll share just in terms of structure, um, at the start of each of the strategic plan goal areas, you will see a link. You can maybe just um, hit it one time, Kathan that takes us to our strategic plan document. So we didn't want to like, you know, share all the objectives and all the strategies again, but that link is also there and accessible. Um, should anyone want to be reminded of what the objectives are and what the strategies are tied to the goal areas. Okay. Um, and so again, each department has done, uh, last year they developed an action plan for the year. So they have specific steps uh, that they plan to take. And each department also has measures that matter. So we will be reporting out on uh, the action steps and the progress of that, um, the measures that matter tied to each goal area, and then uh, next steps for each goal area for this year. All right, so I'm going to turn it over now to our goal three team. All right. Well, um, thank you, Superintendent Kirby. Uh, thank you, board members. Thank you, Mr. Gaynor, for um, giving us some time tonight to um, update you on the great work happening around um, Strategic Plan Goal 3, which, as you know, um, really has to do with family and community engagement, partnerships, and communications. So um, I will go first with my action steps and other updates. And um, following me will be uh, Nancy Pepler and Lisa Hunt. Um, so for the action steps that um, kind of fall under my direct purview, um, the first one here we have is publicizing information on college and career opportunities. So things like um, college fairs, scholarship opportunities, workshops, et cetera. So of course this work is ongoing. Um, this information has been consistently sent the last year through the weekly newsletter, the Peak at the Week, which is sent to all families once a week. Um, it's posted to the Heights High School webpage, shared 
directly to students um, via the high school teams. Um, the high school teams have given some wonderful and informative presentations uh, to, to students and families, uh, most of which have been in person the last year. And um, we helped support that by videotaping many of them and posting them to the district YouTube page so they're easily accessible for all families, um, as well as posting this information on the Heights High webpage on chuh.org. And um, this coming year, we look forward to working um, with Mr. Swaggard's team and the rest of the, um, the, high, the Heights High School um, academic team to further amplify those opportunities for students. Um, next, uh, engaging in the communications audit through um, NSPRA. So uh, this was completed, uh, the bulk of the work, as you'll recall, uh, fall of 2021, and then um, we had our auditor uh, present the results uh, to you all in early 2022. So um, that is complete, and um, connected to that is developing a district-wide communications plan. So um, this is in process based on the NSPR audit. Um, we have identified some key action steps for the next four school years. So I'll, I'll open this document up and share it. I won't go through all of it, but these are um, the, the action steps and recommendations that were recommended to us through the audit. So you'll see with school year 23, um, a lot of the action steps in here, and I'll cover this a little bit later um, towards the end of the goal three presentation, but we really wanted to connect these, of course, to um, the strategic plan and um, our strategies, our objectives, um, and our action steps. So the recommendations are really fitting nicely with um, our overall communication strategy. Um, next, we had re-engaging KinderNet. So um, I'm happy to say that uh, with Lisa's help, um, we actually began meeting again as a group in uh, February. Uh, right now, we have a total of seven um, representatives identified. And um, we spent this past year really just um, connecting and um, connecting with other groups such as the Early Childhood Collaborative and really getting our um, feet on the ground and kind of figuring out where we want KinderNet to go next. So um, we'll be connecting with them again in the fall um, to get some more work started um, with reaching out to those early families. And they... Um, some of the reps have been there for a while, some of the reps are new, but they're all really excited and have all, already um, all started reaching out to families in their community. Um, so next we have engaging in student retention plan with uh, KCA K through 12. So KCA K through 12 is um, a strategic communications uh, company that has a um, specific sector just for school. Um, so heading into last school year, 2021, um, they gathered uh, data on our family's plans for the following school year for um, several specific schools. And so using that data along with um, some existing data um, so with the help of the teachers union, we sent mailers out. Uh, we visited the homes um, of some of our homeschool and ed choice families and gave them some information about uh, Tiger Virtual Academy and other opportunities that they could have in CHUH. And then heading into this next school year, they gathered data on um, families' plans for um, the following school year at five schools. So this occurred, um, this work started at the end of last school year and, and with the intention of getting the information for this school year. Um, I do have a link to the full report in there if you'd like to see it. Um, we found that it turns out a, a very small percentage plan to go elsewhere, and of that small percentage, about half of them indicated that they're moving. So that is um, useful data for us moving forward um, to see what's going on with um, many of our families moving forward. Um, and next, we uh, engage student voices in amplifying the work happening in the district. So of course, um, this is really at the core of communications work. So we're continuing to tell the stories um, with with students and their experiences really at the core. And as you'll recall, um, we submitted a um, student produced video last year. Um, the CTE program created a wonderful marketing video for the um, for the uh, physical, uh, I think, I forget exactly what it's called right now, but the, for the physical health program. Um, and we submitted that to the OSPRA um, 
awards committee and they were awarded best of the best out of the whole state. So we were really proud of them for that. Um, next was uh, launching the, the equity webpage and I can bring that up for you now. There is a link in the slides. So um, this does live under the academics tab on our homepage. So here um, we have the policy here. We have a graphic um, spelling out the different tenets of the policy as well as some information on the task force. And on the right hand side we have some information, um, just some different resources. We have testimonials as well as some related news stories. So we'll continue to update that. Um, with different news and information as we move forward. Okay, so for um, the measures that matter for our 2026 goals, um, one of those was 90% of students have at least one parent or guardian uh, with an infinite campus account. So as of early July, 76% uh, of our students have at least one parent um, who has an infinite campus account. Uh, so we are working with registration and data um, to try and make the process automatic upon enrollment um, so that that is in process right now. And um, in 2020, uh, the data department actually made the process even easier. Um, instead of having to enter in a big code, you could actually just submit a request form. So you could um, just tell them what username and password you want, and they will create an account for you if you don't already have one. So we try to push that at every turn. So next, we have 90% of stakeholders are satisfied with district and school communication. So um, as, you'll, as you'll recall, we sent out a pretty comprehensive um, end of year survey to our students, our staff, and um, our families. And um, I have a breakdown here, but we um, determined that 70% of stakeholders uh, this past year were satisfied with district and school communication um, as a whole. So we considered satisfied um, rating it a four or a five on a scale of one to five. So there's a whole breakdown here of how the families responded um, with regard to district communication and how staff responded regarding district communication, as well as um, how families and staff um, um, rated teacher and principal communication as well as communication um, coming from their supervisor. So we took all of that into account um, when we came up with that number of 70% um, satisfaction. So the ultimate goal is to get to 90%. Next 5% increase in satisfaction with um, students' experiences on um, the annual parent survey. So um, we did this in four categories. So there was the academic learning experiences, social emotional learning experiences, sports and extracurricular activities, and health and safety. Uh, so you'll see here that 64%, um, again, with the rating of four to five, um, were uh, uh, they gave their um, children a, f a four or five rating for their academic learning experiences and, and down, and you can see there. So um, the goal for next year will be to have um, five percentage points higher for each of those um, ratings. And I will turn it over to uh, Nancy, who will give you um, her updates on her action steps. Hi, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, so my um, progress update on the action steps for my goals are, first of all, to launch the pilot community learning center at Noble Elementary and um, develop the needs assessment around the launch of the, of the pilot. And we did launch. We had a CLC organizer at Noble uh, throughout this past year. We expanded our partnerships through the needs assessment. And I just shared a couple of them there. So for example, we launched the uh, food bank distribution of weekend food um, uh, backpacks for students. And one of the most um, exciting things that we did was families said as a result through the needs assessment, assessment that they wanted more fun activities for them to attend with their students. And so we had uh, Friday fun events every Friday night this summer at Noble, and we had over 700 people attend those events. Wow. Um, attend Saturday morning exercise <coughs> classes, which was another thing that they requested, and attend literacy nights and popsicle play dates. So there was a lot of activity at Noble this summer that was directly related to the needs assessment and the work of the organizer at at the Noble CLC. 
Um, I do want to say that we focused a lot at those um, Friday fun nights, fun Friday nights, or whatever we call them. I don't remember the exact name. On on bringing partnership organizations in, also. So Family Connections was there at almost every single event. Um, Lake Erie Inc. was there. Metro Health was there. The Heights Libraries were there. Um, Holden Arboretum was there. So we had a number of partner organizations that attended, and then we also um, hired local and I'm talking hyper-local, so often the parents of Noble students who have their own catering businesses to feed the people who attended the, the events. So it really <laughs> matches well with the philosophy of community learning centers. Um, so another goal for um, in my action steps is to identify additional community partnerships needed to meet student and family and community needs. And this um, is something that we do on an ongoing basis, but I see this really being able to be more systematized in this school year with the launch or the expansion of the post-secondary planning system surveys that really tell us where the gaps are for our students. And then also through meetings with building leadership. Um, a couple other goals were to retrain counselors and social workers on the use of the post-secondary planning system, and that, that was done, and it is an ongoing um, process. And then also to, for the first year, we completed family, staff, and student surveys related to the post-secondary planning system. So the um, next measure is for a 5% annual increase in impactful community partnerships. So that's a, that's a tough one. How do you measure impactful community partnerships? Initially, the KPI had been 100% of our buildings have impactful community partnerships, but we're already there. I would say that our principals and our, um, and our building leadership believe that we have impactful community partnerships at all of our buildings. So in consultation with the superintendent and, and the team, we decided to um, update this to be a 5% annual increase in those impactful community partnerships. And that baseline will be determined um, through community partner mapping with the principals. We did that a few years ago, but that needs to be updated because a lot has changed during COVID. Um, and the one other change that we're implementing to get to that impactful um, measure is that we will be asking our community partners for the first time to identify how their mission and the work that they will be um, doing in partnership with our schools in our buildings, how they, those goals align with the building level action plans and to be very explicit about how they can support our building goals so that that's a new thing for the district and we're excited about that so you're going to set a baseline this year right okay right so um that might be me. oh that's you already lisa good evening everyone i'm sorry my computer's under construction Here. so i'll go back and forth between nancy's and the screen <laughs> um so my goal update for goal three um the action the action steps. Hit the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to use try to use a teacher voice. <laughs> so the action steps related to my work in goal three is to continue to support building level teams in establishing family engagement strategies as a practice, um, and building the partnerships with families to help them support the building level action plans. Linking family engagement to learning and making sure that 100% of our schools develop a family engagement strategy connected to their action plans. We also want to make sure that we have 100% of our schools developing a, me a measurable plan beyond our NNPS schools. Our national network of partnership schools have some built-in measurables. Um, they have um, the ability to allow us to look at events um, and be a little bit more critical about what we're doing, connecting the families to the work that we do in the buildings. Um, but in addition to that, we do want to establish a baseline. There's things that we do every day in our buildings that we're not necessarily looking to collect and reflect on, so we're talking more about that. Um, so 
in regard to supporting our BLTs and our um, building level action plans, really making sure that we link family engagement to learning. Um, as a means of capacity building, we want to make sure that we're supporting our families uh, to give them the ability to support their scholars and students, um, and making sure that we're looking at family engagement as a school improvement strategy. So again, we talk about our building level action plans and giving families the opportunity to support. Um, one of those high level strategies was how many of our buildings um, had the goal of improving attendance. That's a perfect example of continuing to provide resources to families and providing strategies that families can connect to improve. We think the levers of change, you can't eliminate families from that conversation. They're getting our kids up, they're getting them to schools. So we wanna make sure that we provide them resources. Um, and just for an example of how NNPS is about organizing the work, um, many of our national network of partnership schools were the three that we were actively looking at. They developed an attendance committee. And so that real structured work around looking at the goals and how do we all collectively work on them together is a perfect example of what NNPS helps us do, organize the family engagement work. So for me, um, measures that matter, I'll be sharing that 100% of our schools have active parent groups. Um, as Nancy mentioned, when we think about our plan, it's a living plan. So when we think about active parent groups, that's part of um, the work that we know we've got PTAs, we've got KinderNet, we've got groups that are there, but we also wanna make sure that they're effective and connected to the work that we do. So we're looking at 100% of our school leaders really looking at providing or having professional develop to really pull families into the work and making sure that we're supporting um, effective family engagement strategies. We want to make sure that family engagement, or I'm sorry, I, the family engagement specialist, continues to work on supporting and collaborating uh, with our parent groups. It's important that we think in terms of leaders need sustainable support, um, and we want to make sure that we are connecting with them and collaborating with them. It's very important. Um, to grow a more sustainable approach to leadership, we have to think in terms of how do we build a parent network. That's how Kindernet kind of, we had to relaunch it. We have to think about having sustainability. Um, and regard, in regard to progress, uh, we want to make sure that we are um, considering our numerous stakeholder groups. Um, so when we say Kindernet, we also have to think about our exceptional children's advocacy group. We have to think about our PTA and our PTA Council. Um, so my work also includes those um, groups as leaders and supports. And also a focus on not just active, um, but effective, and making sure that we use the language and continue the practice around building that partnership connected to student learning. All right, so talking about next steps uh, for this next school year, um, again, we'll kind of go down the line with our next steps. Um, so we are engaging in uh, additional marketing outreach with Little Jacket. So as you'll recall, uh, they aided us about six years ago with developing the Public is for All campaign. So um, you can think of this almost like a Public is for All campaign 2.0. So it's gonna be revived. You'll see some additional signage, um, some additional videos, and um, other marketing collateral over the next year uh, through Little Jacket. So uh, connected to that, we also wanna add a marketing emphasis to uh, the onboarding process for our new families. Um, really get them you know, um, acclimated and develop that first impression early, that really positive first impression. So um, that work has already started. Um, we sent a letter to all of our new families, um, and we'll be getting a new round of, of new families um, to send this letter to soon. But we sent them a letter, I think the first round was about 300 of them, and the letter told them that they could come to the board and pick up a welcome packet and a t-shirt uh, for their child. So. Um, I think so far we've had about 30 families come through, maybe 35. Um, so we're hoping, um, you know, as we continue to do this, that word will spread and, hey, you get a free T-shirt for your kiddo. So um, that's been really cool so far as well to kind of get them in the building and you meet the kids and, and the families. So that's been really um, neat so far. 
Uh, so we also want to clearly define the communication role of all of our departments and our schools um, as being collaborators with the communications department as a whole. So that's kind of connected to um, the next step in developing um, a consistent process for how key information is communicated within the school system. So we need some better structures um, as far as uh, the, the flow of information goes um, and both ways as well. So uh, we want to create a crisis communications plan. Um, we do have a basic plan. Um, it already exists as part of our emergency management plans, but it definitely needs um, fine-tuned and some additional details added to that. And we want to make better use of our individual and school uh, and department websites as well. So some of that work did start over uh, the summer with cleaning up some of the school websites and um, dusting them off a little bit, giving them some additional um, information, but there's still some work to be done there as well. And um, we do know that those pages are really important in marketing. That's often the first place that that parents look um, when they're um, exploring their choices for their children. So we want to be sure that um, we're leveraging those as best we can. So my next steps related to the KPIs um, are to, again, I spoke about this, meet with the principals by the end of September to have those uh, that baseline developed for the existing partnerships and begin to identify needs for potential new partnerships using the PPS data but also using information from the building level leadership. Um, work with uh, communications and the building leadership to increase our um, PPS family survey completion in the fall, our, our numbers for the in this fall, um, and secure the goal dates for PPS student survey completion and staff survey completion. There was one um, thing that looking back on last year, we tried to implement PPS for both staff and students at the same time in the spring of last year, and that was a, a little too much for our building. Um, for our building partners and it was a lot to ask them as a heavy lift so we're we're separating those two because it requires a real partnership between me and and um, the building leaders they usually assigned one person for the PPS survey task so those are the next steps um, I, I do feel like I need to to say that these are all connected to the KPIs and one of the major pieces of work that we're doing right now is around our expansion of our partnership with Metro Health and the Wellness Center and that's up under this partnership um, goal. So I'm, while I'm not talking about it, it's obviously a big piece of the work for me and, and for, um, for the district right now. So next steps for me, um, we talk about family engagement as an equity strategy because it is implemented, it is part of our goal. It's a major uh, goal in our educational equity policy. So um, we've launched the equity building champion. So we have a champion at every building. Um, their role is to continue to have uh, embrace their hand and have dialogue around cross-cultural conversations and opportunities that get us around um, sort of that discomfort around having conversations around equity. So we have peer-to-peer uh, -peer support in our buildings. So the next step will be to amplify mm -hmm. and support them in each of our buildings. Um, we'll also be relaunching our Heights Family Academy. That parent university is coming up. I hope you guys will think about presenting. Uh, school funding was a really important one. Um, and I think it's a little known issue that we can keep um, raising awareness about. Um, but that's the aim of that initiative, to continue to build capacity for families um, and to share funds of knowledge. We open it up for um, community members and staff to present. So that's coming back September 10th. Uh, we'll be back at the high school, 9 to noon. Um, my next step also is to continue supporting the growth and implementation of NNPS. It is a powerful tool. We believe in evidence-based tools, so that's a great way to organize our work. Um, and continue to support our building leadership um, and district leadership to really look at family engagement in a way that is goal-centered. Um, if we say we're going to do a literacy night, have we asked the requisite questions? Did you learn more about literacy? Um, and so really making sure that we're intentional about our work. Um, also continue to collaborate with our title leads who have a huge amount of responsibility and know-how on beyond compliance, really just connecting with families. 
um, and continue to support them and our parent, parent groups, which I meant, mentioned the various groups that we have, to make sure that we're strengthening that partnership and supporting them. Um, the next step also is to continue to support um, our building leadership teams and have professional development that is specifically focused on family engagement and some strategies and conversations that individual teams may need and individual schools may need. And lastly, um, renew the focus on establishing clear benchmarks. We've talked about measurables. Uh, the superintendent is um, hanging us on these KPIs. And we want to make sure that we are collecting to reflect on the work. There's a ton of great things happening. But if we're not asking questions of the data or we're not collecting, um, then we'll continue to sort of be in this cycle. So benchmarking first year uh, to make sure that we know how many are coming in the building. Have we asked those questions? Um, how was the event? What could we do better? Uh, what would you like to see? Um, and taking advantage of that. So that's a first year focus for me too. I think it probably would be good to pause because this is, I know this is a lot of information. I will say our other goal areas don't have um, as much, <laughs> although they have a lot, um, but it's just a little different. But, you know, I think we might want to pause and get some questions here before we move to the next goals. Thank you. A fire hose. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a question which is related to several of the things I've just heard. Um, I know we've talked in the past about initiating exit interviews for families who leave the district. I wanted to know how that's being implemented and are we learning anything useful from them? So um, what we've done the last couple years with that, um, so it, it used to just kind of live on the website and no one was really going to Correct. it naturally. Why would they? Um, so we actually have been um, asking the schools and the registration department to provide um, paper copies or provide um, a way for them to do it online um, upon uh, withdrawing from the district. So. Um, I can definitely look up some of the data from that. Um, it's actually, in terms of why people are leaving, pretty similar to what um, Casey found for um, what's happening next year. I want to say it's about half, maybe a little more than half, um, are moving. Mm -hmm. So um, there's that. And I think we, we need to reiterate the importance of getting these exit interviews um, and, and kind of remind them. But the schools in general have been doing a really good job. Um, occasionally I'll get, a, I'll get a paper copy and, you know, in, in our office mail, and then I can just kind of put it into the survey monkey um, and add it to that data. So I can certainly bring that up and share it with you all. Um, I've kind of broken it down um, <coughs> into, into different pieces as far as how um, they're, they're <coughs> responding. But we've gotten some decent data from it. That's great, because obviously people who are moving are moving, but then there's the remaining sure. half. Okay. There's why are they moving? I mean, that's another question. Right. Are they moving because right. they're going out of state or they're going for another job and they're going far away, or are they moving to another community nearby because of a perception? And that's something I care very deeply about. Well, there's... It, sorry to follow <coughs> what you guys are saying and then start digging into all the data and I'm looking right now at the uh, retention campaign, and I look at the Garrity number. Let's not dig into, like, all the detail right now, but, I mean, when you look at some of those numbers, it's alarming. Mm -hmm. and, and is it just moving? So I'd really love to know, you know, what is, I mean, as Jody says, what's, you know, why are they moving? Um, or why are they undecided? Um, I was surprised there weren't a lot of people that said, please contact me. There was very few of those. So it seems to me that they're willing to tell you in a survey. So this is great data. You know, and if looking at the way the lines are drawn for Garrity, you know, a lot of those, a lot of the families are um, that South Euclid neighborhood that's, you know, ward, what, four year, whatever, and some of it's University Heights. And I understand if you outgrow your home, you know, I know, Plenty of my neighbors, they have three or four kids. It's three bedroom, one and a half bath houses. They're outgrowing their home. But are they outgrowing their home and moving to another community? Or are they outgrowing their home and staying within our school district and maybe just buying a larger home somewhere else within our boundaries? And that's ideally what I would like to see. I would like to see people love our district enough that when they outgrow their home, they intentionally stay here. They want their kids to be in our school district. 
um, versus going to another community. And that's something I think that we need to dig into a little bit deeper and not just accept, well, they're moving, and so that's, you know, the end of it. I mean, there's, there's always the story behind the story, and, and I want us to be looking into that. I agree. I wonder if maybe it's something we can um, work with the cities on as well. They might have information as far as why people are going, why people are coming even. So it'd be a great idea to work with the cities because obviously they want to retain, retain families here as well. Right. right. Can, can you, you maybe put that on your agenda for the next joint meeting we have? Okay. That'd be great. Liz, can you explain um, or give me the meaning of the KPIs? I noticed that. Oh, yes. Key uh, performance. Th thank okay. you for the question. I should have put a definition. A key performance indicator. Okay. So this is just like the data that, you know, help us know if we're making progress towards the goals. Yeah. So one of my questions was dashboard. Because I think that's something which we were talking about doing. Do you mm -hmm. envision putting these in the dashboard? These will go into the dashboard. Okay. Yeah. The, I don't have the dash, the updated dashboard um, to present tonight, but these will go on the dashboard. That yeah, I mean, yeah. I didn't, mm -hmm. I wouldn't expect that at that point, yep. at this point. So on slide 10, one of the things you mentioned is the um, getting the infinite campus account, you know, the number of people in infinite campus. I think that's a great goal. Um, I would also work with your PTAs to encourage that. Um, I know when I was in PTA, one of the ways I could get people to sign up immediately was reminding them that this is how we contact you if there's a snow day. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a <laughs> minor right. thing, but the number of people who would whip out their phone and just instantly sign up for Infinite Campus as soon as they heard that was, I mean, it was a big incentive, especially when you're talking about elementary school children coming in. So that's something that, you know, just a little thing that maybe it's another way to encourage people to sign up. Um, I did, I actually have a bunch of questions that probably saw me writing fast and furious. Um, this one is for Nancy, and it's a question about, um, and there's no slide numbers on here, so it's hard for me to follow, except I wrote notes. When you're talking about the Community Learning Center at Noble, I was very excited to hear about that progress. I'm just wondering if there's any plans to expand that beyond Noble at this point. I know that was a pilot, and how are we looking at that as, you know, it's a successful program. Yeah. How are we going to grow it? Yeah, so um, we will be expanding to Oxford this year. Okay. Um, we will be delaying hiring an organizer because we are in the process of working on a federal grant for full service community schools hmm. that has a no supplantation requirement. And so if we hire the person before we find out if we receive the funding or not, we can't charge that <laughs> those expenses off. So let's not do that. So we're, <laughs> right. we're, we're applying for that. Um, it's due September, I believe, 14th. And, um, and we'll know in November or early December. So I, and I think that the Oxford team is thankful for some some time to get their sea, le sea legs on planning also for that, but they're excited about it after hearing about a lot of the things happening at Noble. I'm sure. It's excellent. Yeah. So with that funding, will you only be able to, but will Oxford be the only school, would you be able to expand those? Well, so um, if we get it, and it's highly competitive, I believe it's 58 million available nationwide, and the grant, the maximum grant is two and a half million for five years, so <coughs> half a million a year for five years. Mm -hmm. And the the intent um, behind the uh, the full service community schools grant is to use some of the dollars, obviously, for staffing, but some of them for purchase services for enrichment and supports. And so at this point for the budget planning, Sue Pardee and I and Lisa's working with us on that and uh, Christian Copez Minor, who's the organizer at Noble, we're looking at um, launching a third during that five year um, grant period if we receive it. Yeah, so. we'd like to see Boulevard. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a lot of great work. Um, and I think when we look at the example of Noble and the flurry of events that have been, you know, happening and people coming out and being able to count it, right, and really think in terms of what's happening, 
um, we have to consider that, you know, it's a process of building, right? And so um, as we watch what happens at Noble, other schools and other leaders uh, can see that those pillars, it takes time to build them and strengthen them, right? Um, and they're really important components. Uh, and so what they did at Noble with the community engagement and really doing that needs assessment, design those programs. Um, and so I think it's good that we're rolling them out just because it does take time. Um, and there, there, it does result in some really <coughs> incredible engagement for the community, um, the staff, and for the families. Right. And I, if I could also add that, that a lot of the conversation that we've been having as a, a team here is that it, it um, really makes a lot of sense for us to do this in collaboration with our 21st Century Community Learning Center schools. So Boulevard would make a lot of sense mm -hmm. to be our, our next building. And the reason for that is that when, fam when a small percentage of families at a building have that access to that really um, wonderful enrichment that the 21st century grants bring, it also exacerbates an inequity question within that building about mm -hmm. some Good students point. having access to that and some students not. So, so if implemented well, the community learning center model will allow us to bring those enrichments and supports to more, if not all of our students. Um, with that great partnership with 21st Century because they know how to do it. Right. And then I'm looking on slide 17, and this <coughs> is around the communications, and um, I love that you're adding a marketing emphasis to onboarding and trying to make that a friendlier, you know, process. I would ask you to please also look at registration because I think we all know that has not necessarily been the warm, fuzzy um, that we would like it to be when somebody's coming to our district and that's the first impression we would really like that to be a positive experience and whatever we can do to help bring that to that experience would be wonderful um, I love the idea of develop a consistent process for how key information is communicated within the school system that's something that I've been wanting for a long time and I would also make a recommendation of having some kind of repository of where the message, you know, once a message is sent, where do I go back and find it? And this is something as a parent I struggle with all the time. You know, we have information coming out in so many different ways, whether it's through a remind, whether it's through a message that came from infant campus, whether it's an email, whether it's something I saw on social media that, you know, it was something the district put out. But if I don't stop immediately and put that date in my phone or make a note of that information, I have to go find it later, it's really impossible. And I think that this is um, what also sometimes leads to miscommunication because then parents go to social media and they'll say something like, hey, does anyone know when picture day is? And of course, you know, maybe my child goes to Canterbury and I, I'll say, well, picture day is Tuesday, blah, 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 blah. And somebody else says, no, it's Wednesday. Well, it's because their child goes to Fairfax. And suddenly then everybody goes, oh, this district doesn't know what it's doing and, I, and nobody knows. And it is with the best of intentions that people are trying to help each other by share information. But if there was a way that every single one of our school's pages had a where I could go back and see all the messages that, you know, if I'm a Garrity parent, I can see everything that went out. I just go to the Garrity page. That would be incredibly helpful. Or now at the high school where my kid is, you know, if I could go back and see every message that came out and have that information. If I knew there was one place I could go if I missed something, that that's where I could go to find that information and get it specific for my school. I think that would be really helpful. I know that sounds a lot easier than it is, and I'm sure it's a more challenging thing, but I think that would go a long way to improving communications where people have this perception that they don't have the information they need. Um, it's just a suggestion. Um, and then I did have a question around <coughs> The communications audit that was done, which I thought was fantastic, and I'm so excited that we did that. Um, there was a specific um, uh, recommendation to focus on, you know, having separate internal communications for employees versus external communications that would be like marketing for families. And I just wondered if we're doing anything in that area, if that's something we're planning on um, um, tackling this year or if that's something that we'll be looking at in future years because I do think that that is really key 
Definitely. So um, one thing that Superintendent Kirby and I have been discussing is um, revisiting the internal staff newsletter that we used to put out years ago, and then um, it kind of fell by the wayside. So we did it monthly, and at the time it was a little more um, like soft news oriented, but I think that when we bring it back, it'll be um, a little more information driven because you'll see sometimes um, various information coming from um, different departments, especially this time of year, which isn't a bad thing, but kind of to your point, Jody, then you think of it like, oh, well, where's that sort of central location that I can kind of refer to? And I, it's my vision that this newsletter will serve as that central point of information. So sure, it'll have the softer stuff like staff celebrations and, and things of that nature, but also um, a collection of information by department um, that's pertinent. So. Um, yeah, like I said, we did it a few years ago, and I think it just needs a reboot now. So that's okay. one way we're doing that. Okay, and then um, slide 19. So this is the one just around the relaunch of the Heights Family Academy, and I just wondered how we were measuring the success of that. Um, I know we've we've had it, and then we didn't have it because of COVID, but then we had it virtual, and I just wondered what, you know, you talked about having, you know, are we asking the right questions? How are we aligning it? So how are we going to measure that? That's a great question. Um, I think we went really hard on evaluating every session. Uh, at one point, um, we looked at the overall event, so we've got a feedback form that we'll definitely be employing again. Um, I think the time that we did it, which was uh, February 29th of 2020, right before everything mm -hmm. went to Zerk. Like right um, before. Just yeah, under right, the line. Right before. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and I was warned too. But <laughs> that being said, I think that was the time we kind of relaxed on a lot of the evaluation. But I think as we think in terms of what are we measuring and how are we asking those questions, that's a perfect opportunity uh, to use that. So we'll have some student volunteers. We'll ask them to go in and flash a QR code for any attendees, and then we'll still do the overall event evaluation, too. Okay. And I know you had mentioned possibly doing uh, the school funding session. Not sure about that. Another one that I would love us to see us do, but I don't know that I can commit to doing it because I've got some other things going on. But um, I'd love to see us doing one around the role of a board member. What does a board member do? What are the responsibilities? You know, I, I would like to see, I know there's been interest sometimes in people saying, hey, what does a board member do? How much commitment is it? What does it require? And I think it's, you know, good opportunity to be talking about that. And I know that was something that came up in our communications audit as well. So um, I would like to see us in, in, if September 10th is too soon, I'd like us to be developing something around that in the next several months if we can't get it done in the next several weeks. I know I feel like Jody's putting you guys on the hook for that one. Well, um, I would love I to I already have sent you. you that Google form. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's good to think in terms, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, no, 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 please. Yeah, just in, it's a capacity building thing, right? And mm -hmm. when we talk about supporting KinderNet or PTAs or ECAG, it is about that sustainability awareness, right? Do I want to do that? Do I want to be a leader and raise my hand in that way? And I think having people understand what boards uh, actually do may pique interest for people to run and support in a different way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm totally in agreement with that. And I just think we should, we already have the blueprint from the communications audit on how to proceed. And that's uber transparent. And, you know, two of us are up for, uh, well, two, two seats are either open or we're running again. But, I mean, I think we do need to get more people interested in, in the role of a board, you know, what it is and how you can be effective. Um, I would very much like to take that on. So, um, did you have any other? No, I'm, I didn't. I have enough. No. <laughs> I spoke enough tonight. I, I had a one that also piggybacked on Jody's question about sort of internal communications versus um, external communications. Um, and there was actually another dimension in the communications audit that I actually talked about, like building level communications. And that's always been sort of a difficult. Uh, thing to sort of figure out. I mean, so for example, if you've got a CTE program and you need to communicate to, to those students about immunizations or whatever you may have to have, you know, who does that work? Um, or if something's happening with the graduation class, who does that work? I mean, it's not coming out of your central office. It's coming out of a building of sorts. And figuring that out and giving them the tools um, and you know, a lot of good communications is scripted out. I mean, you just reuse it year after year after year. And you know, who, who can put that together? Um, 
And I love the spreadsheet. I mean, one of our questions for, for Liz um, in the evaluation cycle is, where do we stand with the audit? How is it going to get implemented? You know, seeing that that grid that you put together, and again, this is the, the, the fire hose of information that I was referring to. I mean, we, we got the presentation earlier today. Uh, you know, now, because we're all work, I mean, now we're looking at it, and it's like, I just really want to dig into that. And I'm, but it's, it, it's great to be able to have that kind of data. Um, the, um, for Nancy, you use the term uh, post-secondary uh, planning. Is that the PPS? Is that mm -hmm. what you abbreviate yes. as PPS? Right. And is that the WISE, what was formerly referred it, to as the it WISE It was survey? WISE Foundation. It was the Say Yes product that we actually have our, um, we have the license from Say Yes, but we um, manage our own instance of that product now directly. So, so is that something that's actually available like at the counselor level? Um, yes. Yeah. So our main users are, are, are counselors and social workers, um, and they have access to the individual student level data for their buildings. Um, and then this year we are training our principals to be able to view reports because so they, they can see building level reports. Um, but yes, it's the counselors and the social workers are the main users of the system so I know that there was some uh, difficulty with some privacy information but if you're a teacher I mean it would seem to me you know, you, teachers should be able to pull that up and actually see where some of the gaps are because um, a lot of our kids are closer to their teachers than maybe a counselor or maybe a principal the, I mean obviously the teachers are with them all the time um, I'd love to know a little bit more and, and maybe this can be done offline. It doesn't have to be done. Yeah, I mean, tonight. we can we can talk about it. I'll tell you in all of the other districts nationwide where it's been in or is in use. There's typically a counselor, a social worker, or in Cleveland, the Cleveland Say Yes uses what's called a family support specialist. Huh. That is the main user because if you remember from our my previous presentations, the purpose of um, uh, uh, one of the main purposes of PPS is that counselors and social workers can then use the tool to refer students to community-based or internal resources that we have. So there are something like 339 community organizations representing over 650 distinct programs that are in PPS that each program has been... Um, uh, attached to one of the 30 indicators for th students. So if a student is off track in a, in a social emotional indicator, X number of programs or providers come up that a counselor or social worker could, could refer them to. So, but your point is a, a good one. And one way that we could, we, we could take this back to the, to the PPS task force and bring this bring our task force back together again and talk about it is at least how could um, the how can we share some of that information with teachers uh, maybe on a building level I think on an individual level they have the academic information the social emotional and the health related information um, I think is pro my initial reaction is it's probably more appropriate for the counselors and social workers, but but we we can have that conversation. I think asking teachers to use PPS is is probably not a, um, something that we would do, but ask but seeing if they want to be trained on how to look at individual um, reports possibly would be my initial reaction, Jim. Well, it's stuff like, if I remember right, one of them was, have you been to an eye doctor? And have you, do you, have, do you need glasses? Right. I mean, it's that kind of stuff. Um, and it just seems to me that you don't have glasses, you can't see the board, or you can't see your computer, or you can. Right, but the person, um, we, we, we're not at this point expecting our teachers to make the referral to get the that child who needs glasses glasses that's a nurse counselor social worker okay. right. and and so but you're right it could help it could help teachers to understand why a child might be struggling and we might 
want to have that conversation about how we close that loop on those very specific issues. Thanks. Well, I have two other quick things to say, and one of them is um, I wish Dan Hines was here tonight. Um, <laughs> you know, he's he's yeah. gone through some significant health issues. He seems to be in great spirit and, and getting healthy. Um, but many of these things are things that he has been uh, talking about um, to us, um, to staff, to Liz, and I know he would be very proud of of just this report out. Uh, and I also want to like bring that up a notch and think that our community would be equally proud seeing this. I mean, when you talk about board members and you know people talk about transparency you know this is where transparency starts this is a deep dive into a lot of things some of them could be uncomfortable it's like why are people leaving your buildings well we want to know we want to talk about it we're not going to gloss it over i mean so this is the kind of stuff that i think is extremely helpful for our community to know and understand and how we can be better at what we do um, and although it's hard and it's a little different from what we've done in practice as this district, um, it's going to reap a lot of rewards. Um, and I think you guys are really going to, I think it's a great ride. Um, so I'm really thankful and proud of you guys for this, for this work. Thank you. So. Yeah, I appreciate um, you guys' presentation, and I appreciate that you have attainable goals. <laughs> you know, yeah. Oh, what? I'm sorry. Attainable, Attainable goals. goals. Oh, yeah. 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 Because <laughs> right. solving world peace is everybody's right. goal in the end, but how are we going to get there, right? And this okay. is, it's about, yeah. it's about making incremental improvements as we go along, so. Yeah. Thank you. So should we call up our next team? Sure. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Goal Three Team. Look, we have a we have a title now. Goal You're a Goal Three, three goal Team. Three team. <laughs> Kathan called us the Dream goal Team four. earlier. There you go. <laughs> go with it. <laughs> oh, Carly, you're there. Like phone a friend. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I guess. <laughs> Our Goal Four Team is here. This is the Goal Four Team. <laughs> And Kathan, you're running the slide. Okay. Uh, before I get started, I do want to um, welcome Jeronica Bell is with us today. She's been our interim uh, registration specialist, and um, we just approved her tonight to be our registration specialist. So I'd like to welcome her um, to the professional staff. <laughs> there she is. All right, well, we'll get started on goal four. As you see, goal four is our valued professionals in a culture of excellence, caring, quality, diverse, and collaborative. And we've really been working hard on um, attracting and retaining caring and high qualified staff with diverse experiences and backgrounds who work collaboratively. And if you did come to the breakfast, uh, and I know Malia came to uh, the equity session today during one of our presentations, um, new staff is really ready to go, and they're really excited to be here. So as far as our action steps, um, here are the action steps for our KPIs. Uh, gather feedback, and the GYO is grow your own program, participants about their experiences. Uh, grow your own meeting. Um, we are going to be having a kickoff meeting in September, and we're going to be inviting returning grow your own um, applicants and also interested applicants. And then we're going to survey them at the conclusion of each semester just to talk about barriers and, and what we can do to continue them through the Grow Your Own program. Uh, we did develop a website, uh, and we are going to be getting a newsletter out. Um, and the, the website is there. Um, uh, and uh, at our new class, Classified Staff Orientation, we had about 25 uh, attend that orientation. And uh, the HR staff did go through our Grow Your Own program to try to generate some excitement. And uh, just a real quick for those that aren't sure what our Grow Your Own program is, uh, just some history. In uh, November 2019, we received $50,000 grant from, it's a human capital grant from ODE. 
Uh, and the goals were developing a grow your own program for classified staff who want to pursue a degree in teaching. We all know that um, you know, educators of color are, are very hard to find and as we continue to um, want to bring in staff that look like our students, um, we looked at our classified staff and 85 per them are 85 percent of them are uh, staff of color and want an opportunity to move up and advance and we found there's a lot of um, staff in our classified that have started teaching or started education classes and this gives an opportunity of $2,500 scholarship towards um, we partnered with Cleveland State in 2019 and now we're partnered with many other uh, organizations uh, uh, universities and then in February 2021 that grant was done and then in February 2021 diversifying the educational profession um, ODE offered an extension um, and that was seventy thousand dollars we received the full seventy thousand dollars so that's allowing us to continue to provide twenty five hundred dollar scholarships each semester Okay, as we uh, develop our materials uh, for future employees who apply, we do have a testimonial on the webpage. We did have one staff, um, one classified staff member who was an aide that we did hire on as a pre-K teacher uh, two years ago. Uh, and her testimonial is on our website. Um, classified staff equity training aligned to PD strategic plan. And um, we are looking at, um, this is incorporating, excuse me, incorporating equity task force training into our PD. And we have done that. We are looking for, um, uh, to see if we're gonna incorporate, uh, Public School Works has an implicit biased um, training session that we may be implementing this year. And um, we are reviewing that with our equity task force. That'll be just an additional, um, uh, additional training. And then we wanna implement inclusive interviewing and hiring techniques and establish and strengthening our hiring practices. And we've really um, gone out of our way to make sure we're doing this with fidelity. And some of the things that we are doing is our interview guidelines are aligned to the equity goals. So we are pre-screening pre virtual interviews first. So HR will pre-screen everyone for 10 minutes. Uh, it's kind of nice doing a virtual interview because you can gather so much information um, and you can have many more pre-screened interviews. And those are who, you know, once they make it through the pre-screen, uh, pre we ask equity questions. Um, then those get, um, dot, those give given to the uh, principals. And we are asking for our guidelines is that each interview panel should be diverse and inclusive group of staff representing different roles, backgrounds, ethnicities, ages. And we do recommend three to five in that interview and we've really been consistent doing that for the last two years uh, next slide please so let's talk about the actual measures that matter uh, our goals have been 30 percent annual increase in the number of staff of color uh, you don't have to click on that Kathan but um, board members you're welcome or anyone that has the PowerPoint to click on that that gives the data for all of our staff but I'm just going to highlight um, our certified staff so in 2021 we had 18 new certified staff hired, and we consider certified staff administration professional staff, long-term subs, teachers, and any certified building subs. Eight of those were people of color, so we had a 45% um, in 2021, very proud of that. Uh, and then last year, 21-22, we hired significantly more staff. Uh, again, um, 58 total certified staff, and then 24 were people of color. Um, we're at a 42 percent. Uh, preliminary numbers for this year are, are over 30 percent, but as we continue to move into hiring academic tutors, um, we'll be bringing you that information uh, back at the end of the year. Another KPI, 90 percent retention of all staff yearly. Uh, you can, again, Kath, you don't need to click on that, but if anyone has a PowerPoint, that gives you the total retention rate um, for all our staff and just to highlight certified staff member of color retained at 82 percent all staff at 84 percent and our teaching staff at 92 percent a couple of the goals for um, KPI goals for grow your own so we want hundred percent of our grow your own participants earn their certificate um, the thing with uh, grow your own programs you have to be very patient people are working and it takes 
time, you know, maybe one or two courses they're able to do in a semester. So the Grow Your Own program eventually will continue to, um, I think, be great for this district. We just have to be patient with it. Um, 21 and 22, uh, we did, like I said, we did hire a pre-K teacher from the program who made it through. Uh, we had a 20% increase in the number of applicants in Grow Your Own programs. So 16 applicants in 2021 and six received scholarships, $2,500 per semester. Uh, some received multiple scholarships. As they continue through school, they can apply for more than one semester, and we will give them $2,500 each semester if they apply. Um, and then 17 applicants in 21-22, but 12 of those were new applicants. Um, so seven received scholarships, and some did receive multiple, and five of those are new. So if you see that, that we are getting people in the program, what we want to see is what's preventing them from staying in the program and moving forward. And that's where we're going to start surveying and finding that information out about what those barriers are. And then 100% of our Grow Your Own applicants are people of color. Um, as we look at our safety and security uh, goals for, for Goal 4, um, what we did this year is we reviewed and revised the current district safety practices and protocols as needed. Um, we did have a district safe school advisory committee that started early in the year, and I know uh, Jody was on that committee as well. Um, Beverly. And Beverly was on that committee. Uh, here are the areas of focus that we, we focused on for, for last year. The vulnerability assessment where we had um, a group, we, we, net, we partnered with the education network, safety network, uh, the Clingers, and they have been partners with us all year, uh, great presenters. And they came in and did a vulnerability assessment on all our schools and gave us those results, and we've been working towards uh, resolving those results. Um, we talked about increased student safety, relationship building. We did talk through the sexual assault root cause analysis. We did talk through post-secondary planning systems, and we did talk about threat assessment training. As far as the vulnerability assessment, uh, the high school and middle schools were done in November. Uh, the elementary schools were done in April. We did meet with all the principals and went through all the data. Uh, the principals do have the data now, and we've been working with um, George and Taj with our buildings, as well as the custodians, Ricky Waters with safety and security, and also with all the principals to, um, to do our best to work through those vulnerability, uh, the vulnerability assessment. And the areas of focus was arrival and dismissal, which we know is very, very important. Uh, supervision, evacuation hazards, fire safety, organization and storage, and after hours um, supervision. So as far as our threat assessment training, that happened in June. Uh, each building does have a threat assessment team. And what we are currently doing now is working through the procedures and protocols um, for each of those teams. Um, we are partnering with uh, MTSS. I know you've heard a lot about that. Um, and there are a lot of safety committees already established at the buildings. So we, we, we're probably going to be utilizing the safety committees for the threat assessment teams. And I did put the, um, uh, if anyone has a PowerPoint and they want to dive more into what the threat assessment team is, those are our administrative guidelines, which talks about the different levels of threat and how the um, threat assessment team will address those different levels. So as far as our next step, we're going to use a lot of surveys, uh, collaboration among multiple departments. We're going to continue to expand and update the website with the Grow Your Own information. We're going to hold that Grow Your Own meeting uh, by uh, the end of September. For those interested, we're going to use a Q&A uh, Q&A for participants and again finding out what barriers they may have. We want to expand our mentoring initiatives to support all staff. So we have quite a few new staff members. We want to do everything we can to retain those staff members. So we're going to have a cohort. Um, we're going to talk to them, get feedback, support them with resources, um, and this should help um, increase our retention goals. We're going to meet with staff of color and discuss the goals related to both attraction and retention of staff of color. And we do have some staff that are leaving. We just want to make sure that uh, we want to keep as many staff here as possible. We invested them. We invest in them. 
We provide a lot of PD, that's quality, and we want to keep them here. We want to analyze our new hire and exit data to make sure those strategies adjust, and we want to develop um, a district safety framework. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Do you all want to pause here, or do you want to go through goal five? What's your preference? Um, I'd like to pause now, if that's okay, okay just okay. briefly. Now, you know, every month, we approve the list of new hires and the list of retirees and all those things, but only once a year do we get to attend the new staff breakfast. And the energy yesterday was amazing. It was just wonderful to see so many new people who are excited about starting to work for our students, and that's great. Um, and this morning's equity training for the new hires, which I attended, was superb so you know lisa and rachel coleman excellent did an amazing job as excellent. always but the level of engagement from the people in that room was terrific um and you can really tell that they're going to use this going forward to help our students and that's of course the whole point right so i just want to commend everybody who's been involved in in the onboarding for new employees it i mean the parts that i saw were great and i hope that you know that that level of excitement and energy carries through the school year when things get difficult because they do you know absolutely so. well thank you for that yeah well, there's a lot of energy there mm -hmm. a lot of energy yeah, your team has been busy hiring people. I noticed that. I, I can't remember a time we've hired that many new people at, at once, and that was a very exciting breakfast. And I love the Grow Your Own pro program that you're doing. And I'm really glad that you're talking to participants about what barriers might be. I mean, you're absolutely right. I got my MBA while I was working full-time and traveling, and it was a very hard program and it took me five and a half years so I'm glad that we're going to be patient and understand that you know it takes people a long time when they're working full-time and going to school as well so I, I'm glad you're setting that expectation that we need to be patient and understand that it takes time for this program to work but I think it's absolutely the right thing to do excellent thank you I do want to acknowledge uh, Carla Morris she 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 asked if I didn't I didn't have to bring her up I wouldn't but she is uh, she's our human resources specialist a great thing partner she really does so much for us and has been very involved in the grow your own program with communication so I I do want to recognize Carla Moore sorry Carla I had to do that <laughs> all right any other questions all right thanks so much we'll bring up uh, goal five. like I start here Doug don't I mm -hmm. good evening board members good evening glad to be here tonight uh, Dr. Bowers here and Mr. Gaynor will help with this uh, with the setup up here for goal five um, so we're any action steps uh, the district this uh, Facilities, uh, we're going to discuss the district facilities with staff to uh, review current five-year plans accuracy. So we have five-year plans that have been actually here. This is the end of that cycle. Um, share current year projects with late facilities committee. We did that uh, then earlier this year. Uh, we typically interview architects and consultants to determine which firm can support the district and special uh, projects needs. Lately, I've been going right to Ohio School Council. They vet out uh, numerous architects and they go through that process so we don't have to and GPD has been that uh, architect that they selected and they've been serving us very well uh, so we awarded architect consultants to projects to ensure funds are available by early fall that's our our expectation and then have project documents review reviewed and out for public bid by late March or early April that is the steps to success which will come up later why we had a few that 
we're struggling with. Next slide. Uh, let me move here myself. Easier for me to read this here. So goal five, uh, progress updates and action steps. So we have taken on more uh, improvement construction uh, related work across the entire district than ever before touching every school. Uh, the 21 years, I know maybe before the 21 years I've been here, there may have been, but the 21 years I've been here, this is uh, the most work this district has taken on, uh, hands down, across. I mean, it, you've got to take out the high school and two middle schools. We had uh, more money being spent, but they were in one place, and we had uh, help from uh, architects, and uh, actually we hired a uh, project manager for that. So it wasn't as much involved across the entire district. Um, projects have, uh, we've made, we have spent 11.8 million, just to give you a, a, an overview of what we uh, sent, spent to capital improvements for the district in this past year. Uh, projects that have been completed this year are listed there, Noble, uh, all the roof projects are completed. Um, they started on, they were bid out and started on time. Uh, the following are some of the projects that have been delayed, either due to labor issues, material shortages, and material delivery delays. So it's like a perfect storm, unfortunately, for us. You have COVID, uh, then people were out of work. So a labor shortage has affected everyone, not just truck drivers, but our, from laborers to get uh, on the jobs to masonry uh, people, uh, installing our windows, they, they were short uh, some labor too. So across the board it has affected us. And these specific projects, uh, all have those reasons assigned to them as why we're delayed. So elementary school smart panel project, we uh, are not complete with that yet. And I do have some updates. If you want specifics and ask questions, I do have some updates. Uh, elementary school, um, the controls that we are doing throughout the district, up, upgrading HVAC controls, the schools are done, but the Board of Ed and uh, Wiley and Milliken are not, but so those won't affect students, which is good news. Roxborough Middle School kitchen serving line is probably my biggest concern. It it's, uh, has a lot of work left to be done, and we're trying to manage uh, AVI, how we're going to feed students if we're not uh, completely finished by the time school opens. Bus Depot won't affect students. We're going to transition uh, at the start of school. The bus is over here to Wiley, so the routes will start uh, as promised from uh, Wiley. Metro Health Classroom is delayed. Mainly, uh, we, we got started late on that, and uh, it will go into the school year. Uh, we, we discussed that with the principal and how we're going to manage that. Canterbury and Fairfax Playgrounds, that's totally materials. They will not be here until September. Uh, both principals are aware of how we're going to manage that. Canterbury Windows uh, just had an update today that we expected those to be done, but uh, there were two windows that were not delivered, so we're going to manage that into the school year. Noble Windows, uh, those are starting actually this week, and we uh, worked with the principal how we're going to manage those into the school year. Students are going to be moved around and not in the effect, affected areas. All the work will be done after hours. So goal five, action steps. So develop a master facilities plan uh, that evaluates the school district's facilities using data and a lens on equity across the district. Um, complete transition of the work orders from maintenance and preventive maintenance uh, direct to asset essentials. Set expectations and goals for all operations staff related to preventive maintenance work orders and general work orders. Complete work orders within the established expectations. So we, we transition from, first from it was school dude. We've been using school dude since 2004. Uh, they were sold to a company and then sold again, and our prices prices were increasing. So we, uh, Christy, actually, Dr. Bauer actually came up with uh, forward thinking here and saying, hey, we should be looking at other things. And uh, we did move from, we, we evaluated a few uh, different options, uh, a few different companies, and FMX was the company we decided to go with. They're out of uh, Columbus. Um, they're similar to the school dude platform, but not the same. So we have a lot of learning curves that we're trying to accomplish now. 
we did make it just a, a little backup. Uh, I, we did go from school dude. We upgraded to their asset essentials, and so the staff, the the, the staff that uses the platform every day to do their jobs, um, they're probably not happy with me. But we, so we transitioned to one whole new operation, and now we went to another one. Uh, but they're doing fantastic. The the we have a great staff from IT to across the board from to transportation and uh, maintenance and operations to custodians. They're learning it quickly and will take advantage of uh, what this pr platform has to offer. So we have, uh, the district has transitioned to a new, new, work, new work order system, FMX. Operation staff have had initial training. Uh, the additional training will occur as needed and that's gonna happen throughout the school year. So we, we plan on having uh, numerous group uh, sessions and then any of the employees at any time can actually go on and there's uh, tutorials that they can uh, freshen up with if they need to. Uh, this system also incorporates IT tickets, bus trip requests, facility reservations, so it, it does capture it all. The only thing that's staying with the old school, dude, I, I need to stay there. We have our utilities, all the bills that come in, I send off to, uh, it's now, um, first name of the company. Brightly. Brightly. I think they were just sold to somebody oh. else. Uh, <laughs> I stopped following that. <laughs> but Brightly uh, takes those bills and all the data. So it's not just taking the amount and it, it's taking all the information, uh, the kilowatt hours, everything, and are inputting that into a software program that I have uh, uh, and I can pull up all that data. So we're, I'm actually monitoring our ex uh, expenditures utility-wise, cost and you know usage throughout the district for gas, uh, electric, water, and sewer. So I still need them to do that. It's still expensive, but it's cheaper than hiring an employee or somebody to do that because uh, Lunetta and I used to do that ourselves and we just couldn't keep up with it. The bills just keep coming in. There's too many of them. So this is a, a more cost-effective option for us. As the operation staff learns a new system, uh, the work order uh, completion will be tracked. So this new system as that comes in as part of our goals is to make sure that we have 100% satisfaction throughout the district with the, uh, getting work orders completed and getting them completed on time. Uh, we struggled with managing uh, getting them uh, the follow-up on them. So in uh, some of that is just the isolation that we've had with the custodial staff. So you have you know one staff in one building uh, they need support to do the majority of the work. Uh, so that follow-up now, now they have an operations manager, that's his task is, and his goal is to make sure that that coordination is happening throughout the buildings. Uh, the master facility plan has been updated and shared with the board. This uh, will help once, once you have uh, an opportunity to get together and move with that, it will help me with updating the five-year plan and moving ahead with how we're going to spend our money on our facilities. Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm here to share with you as the former coordinator of technology, and as you know, I transitioned to my role as uh, the director of curriculum instruction as of August 1st. Uh, thank you, Superintendent Kirby and team. Um, so a, a large part of information technology is just continuous life cycle planning. So you will probably always see that on an action step for IT, um, which we've continued to do. Um, but you can see there, those next two bullet points are both related to cybersecurity. So identifying resources and a budget to develop a cybersecurity plan. And then secondly, implementing cybersecurity measures, including user education. So that third one was really the focus of our work during the 21-22 school year was just user education because that is a huge way to prevent um, cyber attacks. So um, in terms of user education, we started to use a platform for security awareness training. Um, and some of you all having district Google accounts, you experience this. So. Um, it actually sends out a simulated phishing attack to all of our staff members' Gmail accounts um, or anyone who has a district account, um, any adult, I should say, who has a district account. And this is almost like job embedded training, right? So um, you're getting something as you're doing your work and you're needing to identify that this, 
this could potentially be um, a fish or a scam. So um, we get a lot of reports on that. We're able to, um, you know, look at what user groups might need some more education and really um, as we start to get more into some staff development planning, um, identify what groups may need to have more targeted um, user education. Then with account security, um, and many of you having district accounts were also involved in this part, with protecting our accounts through two-step verification. So um, beginning in 2019, we actually suggested this as a best practice to our district users. Um, but as of March 2022, um, we did enforce it. So all district accounts now have two-step verification. That's all staff accounts. Um, and at around that same time, we also um, increased security um, or increased password security um, for 184 of what we consider to be legacy accounts. So, you know, back in the 90s, um, we really were not concerned about password length or password security. So um, many of those were updated and now meet the password security requirements. Um, as you know, we are a Google for Education district and using G Suite every day. It is incredible um, the amount of information and the way we can manage accounts and all of our Chromebooks through what's called the Google Admin Council. There are many controls, there are many um, updates that happen in that council every day. Um, and so we do go through a process to do a Google for Education audit. Every two years we've done this. Um, and so we recently got that report back and the team is now working to implement some of those best practices and recommendations. Those do of course primarily relate again to security issues mm -hmm. um, and compliance. We've also um, had a more systematic way to give cybersecurity training. Um, Dr. Lombardo mentioned some public school works training and um, our staff members are used to doing that. And so there is a module that we recently implemented for email safety, phishing, mal malware, and ransomware. So um, staff members did complete that during this last academic year. And we do plan to continue that. That will be an annual um, refresher that all staff will have. All right, I have the last piece of goal five here. Um, and I'll just go through this quickly because most of this uh, we have probably touched on in previous board meetings in terms of uh, uh, different financial updates that we've done. But uh, in terms of goal five, action steps for the last year, uh, we had an action step related to trying to do some additional print material. Uh, we also had an action step related to um, working with IT and a communications department uh, to have an increased web presence. Uh, we had an action step that uh, talked about um, developing a plan to maximize and monitor ESSER funds so that we could both, um, you know, have the supports uh, available and necessary for student success and improve the long-term fiscal position of the district. And finally, we had a step uh, that really was related to advocacy uh, in its many forms uh, in the district. So. Our update on this work, you can see from the bullets there, uh, we do have a new uh, popular annual financial report that is estimated to be uh, coming out in September. So that will be um, uh, something that you've seen before years ago. Um, so we, we do have an updated version of that coming out, which we will be able to distribute uh, at all the events that we, we want to give that information out to very high level <coughs> financial information. Uh, we started the three things, public presentation at regular board meetings, and we have the history of those on the website, again, in an effort to increase transparency and to try to educate the community kind of in small bites in terms of finance and funding uh, kinds of concepts that we wanted people to learn and to, to remember. Uh, we also expanded the monthly financial reports, uh, as you know, and then uh, we had a, a finance newsletter that we've distributed to staff a couple of times. Uh, in terms of the ESSER money, so we did leverage the ESSER II money. Uh, we supplanted for continuity of services. And so that's really what helped us uh, in both bargaining and in um, extending the levy cycle uh, to the degree that we were able to do that. Uh, but also then we're able to target the entirety of ESSER III on 
student success, wellness, and remediation. So that's the plan that we've talked about in work sessions previously, and, and I think periodically we'll be doing updates on how that money's being spent and what those initiatives are uh, in terms of tutoring and, and summer camp and, and, and summer school and all those kinds of things. Um, that's what that ESSER three plan was used for or has been used for thus far. Uh, we also, I didn't note it there, but I, I'll add that in. We did um, do the bond refinancing last year as well, which actually freed up PI dollars, uh, which again kind of ties back to, to George's section of being able to have some additional money to use for projects, um, assuming that all those barriers that we have actually <laughs> have free up and we can do that. And then finally, um, you know, we have uh, provided some testimony on, for example, House Bill 126, but also um, done some work with the Ed Choice lawsuit, which is continuing, and actually that's heating up and increasing a little bit in terms of what we're doing with that. And uh, also the Fair School Funding Plan. Uh, we've continued to provide feedback to both legislators and our professional organizations, but the next biennial budget is coming already. So they're going to start doing that in January. So this is the time when we're going to have to really, um, uh, you know, kind of ramp that up as well because we're going to want to make sure that the Fair School Funding Plan, again, remains as, as the way they're going to fund schools in the next biennial budget and that the increases that we had hoped would be there would be there. So those are, are some updates in terms of action steps for the last school year on the finance stuff. Want me to finish up? Sure. So measures that matter. Uh, the master facilities plan has been implemented. This is in progress. Again, we have uh, updated phase two of that. Uh, ben Alkanakin, the architect, has completed and used uh, current data to update that information, and that has been shared with the board. Why is that important for us? Uh, we, like I said, we are at the end of our five-year plan for actually the second time. So it's been 10 years. Uh, I'm at a point where I need to re-engage architects and consultants to evaluate again our roofs, our facades. Uh, we have not completed window projects yet. Uh, again, we started with Canterbury. We're finishing. I'm going to do Noble next year uh, as long as the funds are available. And we're supposed to continue on with that plan that would affect... Uh, or other schools from Garrity, Roxell, um, yeah, I'm forgetting one. But those, that's, once that ends, I need to, you know, the consultants come in, they evaluate those facilities. If we are going to keep our schools, then I need to make sure that we continue that process. I had to delay Oxford's this year uh, because of funding and time on the parking lot and so on. So there's, there's projects that the decision-making that the board will do from the master uh, plan will uh, help me out a lot to make sure that we get those on track and maintain uh, the process as we go ahead. Uh, the district maintains a strong fiscal position as measured in the five-year forecast that's achieved, uh, thanks to Mr. Gaynor. Uh, district utilizes resources efficiently aligned to the strategic plan and equity policy that's ongoing and will be ongoing for us. Uh, the community is informed of district fiscal picture. That's ongoing. Uh, I know for myself, I have some work to do with uh, Kathan, uh, making sure that I get accurate and up-to-date information on different things that will inform the public. But uh, that's going to be ongoing. And we have, what's our close on here? Goal five, next steps. Focus on construction projects, a successful start at the end of the school year and provide the necessary oversight for all the work being performed. Uh, right now is that time. So I'm already have to find out what we, what we need to do next year and then get the consultants or architects in place and move ahead. Set up a new operating system for the transition of our work uh, to FMX over the summer months. Uh, admin training is in process, progress. So that, that has occurred. Um, and again, there's going to be, as I reported out earlier, there's going to be ongoing training opportunities for our staff. Maintain a positive cash, I'll, I'll do this for you, Mr. Gainer. Maintain a positive <laughs> cash balance in uh, five-year forecast through 2026. Yeah, exactly. Uh, increased advocacy around fair school funding plan as new state biennial budget is developed and continue to identify possible financial data for inclusion on the district's website. And I think that concludes us for goal five. Thanks to Dr. Bauer and Mr. Gaynor. All right. 
First question. I cannot find the revised master facilities plan. I'm poking around uh, the Google Drive and my emails. The updated information? The updated one. I'll make sure you get that. It was sent out. Um, they did that, I want to say, over a month and a half ago, two, maybe even two months ago. But I'll make sure that you get that. Can you send it out. to all of us, please? Yes, I will. Okay, thank you. Because that was my first thing. It's like, updated. I haven't seen it. I haven't read it. And I can't find it. So. They didn't reproduce the whole document again. It's that thick. What they did is I sent out the updates to it. And it was it's mostly data. Okay. Thank you. Um, the one, the eleven point eight million dollars in capital improvements. That's for last fiscal year, or how how are you measuring so time and money because of things taking longer than <coughs> expected? That includes the money that we were fortunate to have left over from the bond. So okay. the middle schools, of course, we didn't spend all the money, and that money was. Uh, to, moved into the permanent improvement budget. So we were afforded that really helped us out a lot to, to sort of catch up on things. I mean, of course, we bought buses. Um, I bought a couple extra buses this year to keep us in line with uh, that need. It helped get these window projects, because without that money, we would have never started the window projects. It's helping with getting Roxborough's kitchen. That was one of the things we wanted to do, because we did not uh, include that in the renovation of Rock's Middle. We felt it was important that we renovated the entire Monticello kitchen and Roxborough's was in need of some sort of sprucing up and it was behind the scenes. So it wasn't, you know, the kitchen, the cafeteria was fine for the students, but once they walked in, it certainly was terrible. Mm -hmm. So that's being worked on. Uh, but that money really came uh, into play, at, probably most importantly with the bus depot and the uh, smart panels because that was not in the five-year plan whatsoever right the smart panels was a a new project that got right added in sort of on short and I should say yeah but back up because excuse me the I mentioned the Roxborough kitchen I just group them all together but financially mm -hmm. that's being paid out of money that AVI has been very good at uh, making us uh, so it's all proceeds that we have made from food service so that's not coming out of permanent proof budget okay Okay, thank you. So the smart panels, uh, when you said they were delayed, I know the project was split in half uh, to do one half this year, one half next year. When you said it was delayed, is it is the half that's going going on right now being delayed? Yes. Okay. And and it's the it's the labor to put the material. We've had the smart panels. We actually purchased the smart panels for next year's work. Um, it's the labor and again we need to go out immediately for next year to you know get somebody on board so they can get their uh, materials ordered and move ahead with it and there was a delay with some of the materials so for this year due to yes for this year so due to some of the the wall structures some of them had to be put on a stand okay and those stands there was a huge delay on those um i know mark was calling on it regularly and i think Yesterday, they even drove, the contractor drove out of state to pick up to the Wisconsin, order. I think it was, right. Yes. And those stands then get bolted or whatever to the floor so we don't have to worry about anything tipping over. Right. Right. Okay. So is there any impact for this coming year? I mean, will... For, for this... Uh, I mean, have you taken out the old smart boards? No. I mean, they've, they've been removed. Yeah, so they, the contractors are working overtime, um, right, they're probably working right now, um, still putting them up. So um, I, I believe they're getting as many in as they can. As they can. Okay, um, right, they work until midnight, if I'm not mistaken. We have contractors working on windows after hours. We, throughout the district, these projects that I mentioned that were being delayed, uh, we're pushing the contractors as hard as we can. Uh, if they have the labor, they're working. One other similar question regarding the playgrounds at Canterbury and um, Fairfax is it are they demoed right now? No. So uh, we were going to proceed with the demo um, principal at Canterbury preferred I didn't Fairfax I probably could have but I didn't want to uh, the contractor was sort of 
going back and forth. Because see, if we demo it, then I have to protect it, protect the site. And nobody has a space to Right, play. so in, in Canterbury, rightfully so, she wants to, to her students to still have some place to play. It's both contractors uh, project a two week from demo to finish, so uh, we're expecting that in September. Oh, well, that's not so bad. No, it's not. That's we're not so bad. we're going to hold it over that months. expectation. Okay, that's great. Okay, great update. Yeah. This is a question or more of a comment for Scott, just around uh, fair school funding. Um, keep that on our radar, and if there's things that we need to be doing as far as pushing in Columbus, being there for testimony, uh, writing letters, making phone calls, please keep us in the loop and. We'll be happy to do whatever you need us to do. We will do that. Thank you. And we have community members who will be um, willing to add their voices. Mm -hmm. So yep. it's not just the same old whiny people. Absolutely. <laughs> Beverly, did you have a question or a comment? No. Oh. Just thank you for your presentation. Thank you. A lot Thank of you. information tonight. Yeah. Yes. I just want to, as, they, as we, you pack up, thank all of our, our presenters for tonight. There is lots of work happening, and people have been working incredibly hard um, all last year and this year as we get ready to start the school year. Um, so uh, thank you very much for the time uh, to present and share your, share your work to everyone. Goals three through five. Yay. <laughs> And that concludes our work session. Um, time for another meeting. Time for another meeting, yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask you to give us a quick summary on the meeting in Toledo on Monday, but since they I'm canceled that, I'm not going to bother. Um, so I am ready for a motion to move into executive session. I motion to move into executive session. I second. Mr. Gaynor, will you call the roll, please? Ms. Wright? Yes. Mr. Posh? Should we also make sure that it's impl that it's for the hiring of... Oh, God, I'm supposed to I read don't the think language. I don't have to read it, but just uh, summarize it. But personnel. It's, it's a personnel. Personnel. Issue. Correct. Okay. Ohio yes. Revised Code something or other. Yes. <laughs> 2122G1. Thank Ms. you, sir. Ms. Serini? <laughs> yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here. We are going to move upstairs.